Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope this is working okay. Um, I'll assume it is, <laughs> and I'll crack on. Um, and if it isn't, then I don't know, I'll have to start again. Okay. Um, so welcome to the Friday Night Live. Um, we haven't got too many questions today, so um, hopefully it won't run to the full hour. Hopefully it'll be sort of near a half an hour or so. Um, first one is, I'm trying to get off drinking every day, but have met up with my boyfriend from junior school days, not seen each other for 45 years, now together for two years. He has been an alcoholic for the last 30 years, as confirmed by his family. He drinks daily and heavily. It's very difficult trying to give up having a partner like this. Um, there's two points, I suppose, two ways of coming at it. Firstly, from your perspective, um, your sobriety has to be strong enough that seeing people drinking isn't going to make you drink. Um, okay, so if you're living with someone who drinks, that makes it more difficult. But at the end of the day, even if you're not living with someone who's drinking, you're going to be seeing people drinking, you're going to be with colleagues and friends and family members who are talking about drinking and drinking. Um, you're going to turn on the TV and see people drinking, you're going to read books about people drinking, it's everywhere. So your sobriety has to be stronger than other people drinking um, and actually seeing other people drinking can be a huge boost I find it a massive boost because I see other people drinking um, you see people looking tired and drained and I think of the ruined sleep they're gonna have um, and actually it can be quite a strong boost for you um, the problem is I think from the other perspective from the relationship perspective um, when you quit you'll not have if, you, if you're with someone who's drinking heavily every day that's going to be pretty much all he does um, and presumably that's the only real thing you have in common um, so when you quit drinking I would think it's going to change your relationship massively because you will probably have nothing in common um, and even if you do I can't imagine he's going to be particularly nice to be around because I don't think there's a single person on the planet who is pleasant to be around when they're drunk if you are sober um, I, I've stopped for just come well, February will be seven years now, um, and I have yet to meet a drunk person that I found remotely interesting or funny or in any way pleasant to be with when I was sober, because drinking makes people idiots. Frankly, it makes them overly emotional. Um, it makes them dull. They repeat themselves. They think they're funnier than they are, and then just not pleasant to be around. So yes, it's going to be, I would think, problematic for you. Um, but that's a relationship issue that I think really you need to get to grips with um, rather than anything else. Um, the next question is, what is the best resource to get slash read to learn what physical damage alcohol has done and what is reversible? Um, yeah, so I'm not the best person to ask about this because my interest in alcohol is more to do with how it is addictive and more to do I suppose with the psychology and sociology side of it which is how it keeps pulling us back in all the time um, I think Professor David Nutt's done quite a lot on it um, which is quite good um, and I think that might be worth um reading so he did drugs without the hot air which was more about drugs generally but there's still a lot of very interesting stuff in there about addiction um, and he's done the book drink which I think is very interesting as well the only thing I would say with him is he he clearly hasn't had an alcohol problem himself so he's very good at identifying all the science and the health damages of alcohol but I think maybe where he falls down a bit is he still talks about moderation because he's not been there, as it were, and realised when you're drinking a lot, you want to keep drinking more. So he, he does kind of talk about learning about alcohol and making your decision to drink as much or as little as you want. Obviously, that doesn't really factor in the effects, the psychological and physical effects of addiction. But it's a very, very good place to start if you're looking at the physical damage. Um, so that's probably a good one um someone else has put my question i'm now out eight months alcohol free after drinking for 40 years 
I've been doing the work, quick lip podcast videos, journaling, etc. all this time. Will I always have to do the work to keep on top or will the message sink in? Um, what I would say is it's going to differ from every individual. So I don't want to drink anymore um, and I don't feel that I have to be constantly working on it. And I know a lot of other people are in that boat. Um, but I think there are another group of people who, who do have to work at it. I would say a few things. Firstly, don't forget the effects of fading effect and, and fading effect bias and ambition, which are basically two ways in that we tend to look back on past events more positively and we tend to idolize something we don't have. So when we quit drinking, for those two reasons, we tend to look back on our drinking days um, and start to glorify them and to think they were far better than they were and kind of start to fantasize about it. Um, so I think you always need to be on your guard for that. Um, but other than that, I, you should be able to get the message. I think if you've still got a fairly, especially after eight months, I think if you've still got a fairly strong desire to drink, the best thing to do is to, because you need to lose that desire. And the way you le lose that desire is to start seeing how the benefits you think you're going to get for drink from drinking are actually false. Okay, so it's impossible for me to sit here and identify the parts that are causing you a problem because it could be that you still think you get a benefit from drinking in the evening. It'd be nice to sit down and have a glass of wine in front of the TV. It might be that you still think you're not going to enjoy yourself so much when you're socialising. Um, it might be that you're dreading Christmas or you've got a holiday coming up. But for whatever situation you've got, you need to analyze yourself. One, what do I think alcohol is going to add to this situation? Two, is it really going to add something to this situation? Or is it going to detract massively from it? And forget the hangovers and all the rest of it, the actual moment that you're glorifying. So if it's, I don't know, Christmas and you're thinking of having that glass of mulled wine or red wine or champagne or anything, start to analyze it properly and think, is that, is it really going to add to the situation? How's it going to make me feel slightly dulled and then a bit anxious afterwards? Um, the bit of Christmas I always remember is kind of like when you've eaten too much and you're feeling really uncomfortable um, and also you've been drinking so you feel really tired. It's just not pleasant to mix alcohol in with it. Um, so that's the thing. It's very hard for me to give any particular comments. You need to analyze yourself. I'm struggling because when I hit the evening, I think it'd be nice to sit down and have a glass of wine um, or whatever it is. Um, the next one, most of my cravings I've managed with either a new routine or just beating them into submission with the ever powerful no. What I still struggle with is the random craving that will happen on sometime Tuesday at 2.27 or whenever. It doesn't happen very often, only two or three times so far. I'm on day 80, but when they do, they're powerful. I'd love to hear your thoughts on those if you have any. I look for triggers, but don't really see anything new. They're just so random. Um, so... With that one, I did, I think the last talk I did was purely on craving. So if you haven't seen that, it might be worth going back to it. But cravings aren't something that just happened to you. Okay, they're a conscious thought process um, and they're a four stage process. And they always start off with you thinking that an alcoholic drink would be nice. Okay, that is a craving. It's you thinking, oh, I wouldn't an alcoholic draw and a beer be nice or a glass of wine or whatever it is. Um, and then when you get into that thought process, you're torturing yourself, really, because you're, you're anticipating having something that you're not going to let yourself have. So whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, sat down in front of the TV for the evening, having a meal with your partner, out with friends, suddenly you're not enjoying the meal, you're not relaxing watching the tv you're not paying attention to your partner or your friends you're because you're 99 of your attention is focused up on this unpleasant internal little dialogue you're having about how much you want to have a drink um 
So that's what cravings are. I mean, if, you, if you're on day 18, you've only had two or three, I count that as a massive um, victory, frankly, because most people are craving all the time or a significant amount of it. Um, but that's what you need to look for. Don't worry about triggers because there's going to be triggers everywhere. As I've mentioned before, people drink all the time. Lots of people do it. So your sobriety can't be reliant on um, never seeing people drinking. So you're going to see people drinking. The thought of an alcoholic drink is going to be jumping into your mind all the time. It's what happens at that point. So the thought of a drink goes into your mind. If you start fantasizing about how lovely it would be and questioning your decision to quit, you're going to be craving. Okay, so that's the thing you need to jump on. Um, so I would personally, if it was me, I wouldn't worry about triggers. You will be thinking about drinking, but you watch where that thought goes. Don't let it become some weird fantasy about how if you had an alcoholic drink, everything would be perfect and you'd be happy because it's a lie and it's nonsense. Um, and that's really the way to deal with triggers. It's to see how that fantasizing is false. Okay. Because that's what a fantasy, so th that's what it is. So thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind. Um, and then you need to deal with it. Then the trouble is with cravings is how it works is the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind you then start fantasizing about it and questioning your decision and torturing yourself about it. Okay. A lot of people don't see it as a stage process. All they know as I start thinking about drinking and I'm craving. So they have a two pronged approach. One is to not think about drinking. So that's never going to work. Is it? I mean, how long can you go in this society without thinking or seeing someone drinking or the other thing to do is just to resist the craving, which again, isn't ideal because all you're doing is just torturing yourself even longer the better thing to do is understand that it is a stage process and rather than stopping it at the start or at the end it's better to jump in at that point in the middle and the best point is after the thought of the drink has entered your head don't start fantasizing about it see the reality a slightly or well, a foul tasting highly sugared carcinogen um, that will make you feel slightly dulled and confused before then making you feel anxious and unpleasant. So you'll need another dose to relieve that anxious feeling. That is it. Um, holidays around the corner for us in the US. Thanksgiving. This will be my first Thanksgiving without alcohol. I will hang on to your words. Make it about family food conversations and the gathering in general. I feel strong. Good. But sometimes I just need to hear confirmation. By the way, everyone drinks in my family except me and my adult son who quit quite a few years back, quit a few years back. Um, so if you've got someone there, your adult son who's not drinking, that's a massive bonus because most of us are going to be in situations where we are the only ones not drinking. Okay, so that's something you do have to cope with. Um, what I was saying before, obviously, your um, your sobriety has to be stronger than that. So you will be seeing people there drinking and chatting and laughing. But don't forget as well, what really draws us in is the thought of, you know, drinking and chatting and laughing with friends and family. But actually, alcohol is not really adding to that anyway, because you can chat and relax and laugh with them. Um, and you will have a nice time. Just remember, it will be slightly different because you're not going to have that real dulled, knocked out feeling that you get from booze, but you will relax and enjoy yourself. You will, as long as you're relaxing and just trying to be comfortable, you will get an endorphin buzz. Okay. So you will start to relax into it. You will have a lovely day. What you'll miss out on is that kind of tired feeling of having drunk too much or that unpleasant feeling when you've eaten and you've also drunk and the alcohol's wearing off, but you can't drink more because you're too full and you start to feel a bit unpleasant. Um, so it is better all round. Um, and just count yourself very lucky that you've got someone else who isn't drinking there because that always makes it massively easier. Um, someone here put help with sleep. I've read chapter four in Alcohol Explained too, and I'm following the five suggestions for better sleep. My body is conditioned to the 2 a.m. wide awake and anxious routine. Will it ever go away? So what you don't say is how long you've quit for. So that would be interesting. Um, if you're in the early days, and by early days, I mean like a week or two, 
it's probably you're just still settling into a normal sleep routine and I wouldn't worry too much. If you're a month or two down the line, um, then yeah, it shouldn't be there then. <laughs> I've completely forgotten what the five suggestions were. I think probably exercise, don't eat too late in the day, don't take stimulants like caffeine or nicotine too late in the day. Um, so you're doing all of that. I don't know if this was in there, but I've mentioned this a few times on the lives, a few times on the lives. But if you need, for example, seven hours sleep and you're going to bed and lying in bed for eight hours, you're going to be awake for one of those hours. And the natural tendency is to sort of wake up in the middle. So a good way to deal with it is to get up at the same time every day, even on weekends or non-working days, if you're a shift worker, but get up at the same time every day with an alarm and then experiment with your bedtime. Um, so if you get up at, I don't know, seven, eight, six, whatever it is, try going to bed a bit later and you're waking up in the middle of the night, just try going to bed half an hour later um, and try that for a few days and then try again. Cause it might be as simple as you're lying in bed for too long. You know, you need six hours sleep and you're in bed for seven um wide awake and anxious is interesting because i wake up quite a lot at night but i don't really find i'm anxious that was a very much alcohol driven thing so if you've got anxiety um i don't know that might be a lifestyle thing if it's severe anxiety see a doctor but i kind of from reading what you're saying i'm assuming it's only really night time that you're anxious um but you could try, certainly as i say try that putting your bed bedtime a bit later and see if that helps you sleep through um, the next one, hi, I'm 45 days alcohol free today. That's fantastic. Well done. I'm looking for advice on how to respond to friends who want me to drink. Last weekend, one of my friends said, you're still doing that? <laughs> this weekend is Halloween and everyone will be drinking. I've read the books and I don't really want to drink, but it's still a challenge figuring out what to say. I'm not ready to share my issues with alcohol with these friends. We only met last year in grad school and I'm generally a more private person. Thanks in advance. Well, so 45 days is brilliant. Okay. And the fact that you don't really want to drink is even more brilliant. So you're there and you've done it. So fantastic. That's really good. Um, what I would say is um, that you don't need to share anything with anyone that you don't want to share with them. It really is that um simple um what i've said to people and it kind of was partly true um i stopped when my children were quite young and indeed one of the reasons i did stop is because i was just tired all the time you don't get enough sleep with kids anyway and alcohol was destroying what little sleep i was having and making it worse and worse so quite often what i say is i quit for a bit um, and i just don't want to do it anymore um and that's quite a good way of doing it because if you say, I don't like it anymore, um, there's very little people can say. Um, because if you come up with excuses like, I don't know, I'm driving, I'm on a fitness kick or a detox, you'll always get, oh, call a taxi or, oh, don't worry, have a drink tonight, worry about it tomorrow and all the rest of it. But if you just say to people, you know what, I just don't like it anymore, I've just gone off it, it's really hard for them to have any kind of comeback. And they may sort of take the mickey a little bit what kind of weirdo are you don't like drinking um but that's quite a difficult thing for people to come back from but no i completely agree with you because i most people i met i haven't really said anything to them other than i don't drink i don't particularly like it anymore um which is absolutely true i quit drinking and i don't like it anymore um simple as that and as i say it is then a bit easier um to stop people having coming back and sort of trying to talk you into it. Can you talk a little on how to help with boredom drinking? Is it a type of craving? When I feel bored, I think I can kill a few hours drinking and sleeping it off. Thank you. So I think I've mentioned boredom drinking in one of the books, although I've forgotten which one. But alcohol just slows your brain down. Okay, so it can make you be entertained by things that would ordinarily bore you. Um, so boredom is a state of not having enough to occupy your mind. Okay. So the normal way of doing something about boredom is to find something to occupy your mind, like a book or a TV program or a new hobby. When you're drinking alcohol, you're going the other way. You're just making your mind more stupid so that something really dull and boring will occupy it. Um, so it doesn't really work. 
it seems odd in this day and age when there's so much online as well, even with lockdown, there's a whole world out there on the internet. There's, you know, lessons, books, everything you could possibly imagine um, to occupy yourself. So there's no real reason to be bored. What you need to do is find something that engages you and go for it. Um, and as I say, even in these days of lockdown, um, there's stuff to do out there. I did a, um, a tour of a closed underground station a couple of weeks ago. It was all online. Um, so there's loads and loads of stuff out there to do. You just need to find it. Um, I have periods when I am positive and motivated and quit for three to four weeks and suddenly crash into anxiety and low mood for a no obvious reason and start drinking again. Any strategies? So the, lots of people have ups and downs, okay, and learning to deal with those ups and particularly downs without alcohol is one of the keys to sobriety. So no one has a perfect life, okay? You don't quit drinking and your life becomes perfect. You still have bad days and on occasion horribly bad days. Um, and the key is to deal with them without recourse to alcohol. Um, so there's a few points there. One, if having a bad day and low mood and anxiety, or whatever, causes you to drink, then that's what you need to deal with. You need to get a coping mechanism in place. Um, and that could be a lot of things. It could be exercise. It could be reading a book. It could be talking to a friend. It could be going for a walk, a swim. It could be meditation, yoga. There's a lot of coping mechanisms out there, but you need to get it in place beforehand. Now, as I say, everybody has bad days and everybody has, you know, we have bad days because something specific happens, but then everyone has bad days where nothing seems to have happened. And you just, you're not in a good place that day. I have it. I, I don't know a single human being who doesn't just some days have very miserable and unpleasant days. So that I wouldn't worry too much about. If it is really we crash into anxiety, um, then that might be something to speak to a doctor about. But what you need to bear in mind is alcohol isn't helping it because when the alcohol wears off, you're not only back to where you were, but you've then got the alcohol withdrawal on top of it. So if you've got five points of anxiety, alcohol may take you down to two for 20 minutes, but then it's going to knock you up to 15, 20 points when it wears off. So it's of all the different things you can do to cope with your anxiety, alcohol should be right at the bottom of the list because it doesn't help at all. It just makes things really worse. Um, and that's just the chemical side of it to say nothing of then not sleeping properly, which isn't going to help anyway. Um, hi, William. Is being open with friends and family about your alcohol addiction a necessary part of recovery? I have never discussed the extent of my drinking with anyone outside this group and even then created a profile just to join this group. I was sober six months this year, January to June, then relapsed and now eight weeks sober again. Just wondering if accountability to close ones would prevent me from relapsing again. So I would say, and this may not be a popular opinion, but I would say, no, absolutely not. You don't have to be open with anyone about your addiction. Um, as a necessary part of recovery it's personal to you and you discuss that with whomever you want to discuss it with and if that is nobody you discuss it with nobody um it's your thing okay some people find help and support from friends and family to be crucial personally i didn't um i kind of like to do things on my own anyway um, and as i say your sobriety should be bulletproof anyway it shouldn't be reliant on other people because other people may or may not be there to support you all the time. And if you're completely reliant on other people, if they're doing something and they're not there when you're having a bad day, what are you going to do? Um, so I would say absolutely not. You do not need to discuss it with anyone. Um, and if you're not comfortable with it, then you shouldn't be doing it at all. Um, whether it makes you more accountable, um, I can kind of see the argument if you go and tell everyone you've st stopped drinking, there's more kind of pressure on you or more encouragement to not drink again. Um, I don't know that that necessarily helps because we have our own pressures to quit anyway. We know drinking is a horrible thing and it, we're miserable when we do it. Um, so I would think rather than telling a load of people in the hopes that you're then kind of pressurized into not drinking. That's probably not the best way of going about it. And I think in a way it can make it worse because I think 
if you tell all your friends and family, I've got a serious drinking problem and I've got to stop drinking, I've quit, it's fine. But then I can kind of see that if you were to have a relapse, it's going to be so much worse because you've let everyone down. People are going to be talking to you and saying all kinds of things that may or may not be helpful. And that actually may make everything a lot worse. You may have a, you may have a relapse. You may have a few drinks. You may feel rubbish the next day and you may pick yourself up and get on with it. But if your whole friends and family are then jumping on top of you saying, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. It's going to make it, I would think harder rather than easier to pick yourself up again. Um, so no, I think the other thing is as well, and this is true of everything, you need to build your own sobriety. So you do what's right for you. So for some people, that accountability is very important. Um, others probably less so. Um, so yeah, if you're a private person, and you don't want to talk about it, then don't. Absolutely not. And you're eight weeks sober now. So that's fantastic. So I would just stick with it if I was you. Um, coping with other people drinking around you how to make that bearable not sure I will have the patience <laughs> I don't have the patience um, I try to have exit strategies so I never hang around late if I don't have to sometimes I don't have that option so my wife and I sometimes go out um, and she likes to stay until the end of a social occasion so like one or two in the morning um, and I don't enjoy it, frankly. Um, I haven't got an answer. And if you find one, please do let me know. Um, but what I like to do ideally is to go to social occasions. And when people start to show the effects of alcohol, I leave because I do find them irritating, frankly. Um, so, yeah, the other thing you can do, though, is drunk people are irritating. They're selfish. They're not funny. They think they're funny. They stand too close. They spit when they speak. They're not very pleasant. So if you are stuck with that, you can't get rid of it. Um, it can build your sobriety at least. So you can look at them and think, oh my God, I used to do that and think I was really cool and really funny. And I wasn't. Thank God I'm not doing that anymore. So if you are stuck in that situation, um, at least work it to your advantage, I suppose. But yes, I don't have the patience either. Um, and I, yeah, if you do come up with a solution, let me know. I've even left places and just gone for a walk, um, like we've been out for the evening. Um, and people don't really notice because they're all drunk and they don't know if you've gone to the toilet or you're talking to another group or whatever. And I've literally just walked out and gone for a walk for half an hour just to get away from everyone. Um, the next question. Hi, William. Is an addictive personality a real thing or is it more that people who spot one addiction for another simply haven't dealt with the issues that they are trying to block out? So I don't think it's either. I don't think addictive personality is a real thing. Um, I think rather it's a coping mechanism. So particularly with alcohol, because it's a sedative and it sedates our feelings, if you drink regularly, you tend to drink when you've had a bad day. You drink to celebrate as well and to socialize. But, you know, if you have a bad day at work, you go home and you have a glass of wine or a beer or something to take the edge off it. And you become, that becomes very habitual. So whenever anything bad happens or you want to change how you're feeling, you get very used to reaching for something to consume to change how you feel. So then when you quit drinking, you just reach for the next thing to consume to change how you feel. So it could be cigarettes or caffeine or other drugs or sh refined sugar or eating or whatever it is. Um, and it's not that you have an addictive personality. It's just that you're used to consuming things to change how you feel. Um, so again, that goes back to part of your sobriety should be coping mechanisms. So I'm going to have a bad day at some point. And when I do, I'm going to go for a run or a cycle or a walk, or I'm going to speak to a friend, or I'm going to tuck up in bed with a good book or a film or get a, whatever it is. Okay. So I think there's that aspect. Um, but I also don't think that um, people who swap one addiction for another simply haven't dealt with the issues that they're trying to block out. Some people have issues that they're trying to block out. OK, so if you've got those things constantly hanging over you, it's going to make you more likely, I guess, to reach for a drink. But a lot of people don't have those issues. Um, and I think this is one of the misconceptions about drinking is that you have to have some kind of underlying issue that causes you to drink or to become addicted. 
Um, most people don't have that. Most people, the formula isn't, I'm morbidly depressed because I have X, Y, and Z that's happened in my life, so I'm going to start drinking. For most people, it is, you're a teenager, you're out with friends and they're drinking, so you do it, and it seems to be like fun, so you keep doing it. And over the years, it becomes a bigger and bigger part of your life, not because you have underlying issues, but because of the nature of the drug. When it wears off, it creates an unpleasant feeling and you need another dose to get rid of that unpleasant feeling. And over the years, you become increasingly reliant on it to get you through good times and bad. Um, and that's what it is. It makes it feel like we can have underlying issues because when it wears off, we feel very mentally frail and weak. So things that wouldn't otherwise bother us suddenly blow out of all proportion and then when you drink you go back to normal and those problems actually aren't that major anyway so i would have if you spoke to me i don't know eight years ago i would have told you that i drank heavily because of my military service in iraq my home life i didn't like my job and i would have genuinely believed that those three things were the things that were making me drink but then i quit drinking um, and within a few months, suddenly I found that none of those things were a massive problem. Yes, I wasn't particularly happy with either of the, any of them, but I coped with them. I changed my job. I sorted a lot of stuff out and it all fell into place. And I think that is another key. A lot of people, everyone in the world has issues. Okay. Everybody has problems, some more severe than others, admittedly, but everyone has problems. It's how you cope with the problems that are the prop, the issue, not the problems themselves. If you decide that whenever you have a problem, you're going to put something in your mouth in the hopes it will anesthetize it, then you're going to be ending up with addictive behavior. But if you decide you're going to go to therapy or go for a run or do any of the things I talked about for coping mechanisms, then you're not. Um, and to be honest, I served out in Iraq with hundreds of other people. Um, some of them ended up drinking too much. One of them ended up killing himself. Most of them ended up fine. Um, so it's not what happened out there. It's how you deal with it. Um, so the last one, hi William, I've realized that all I've been doing is putting poison into my body yet somehow the hype around this poison seems to have some kind of hold on me. Sometimes I see myself or used to as James Bond or some other glorified drunk. The brainwashing seems to subtly continue occasionally. It seems to be very subtle. That little thought when you see someone holding a glass seems to bring back memories or false memories of happy times drinking. Just wondered what you thought. Thanks. So yeah, I mean, these, this is part of the problem because you quit and you're very happy to quit and you realize life's massively better when you quit. But the problem is every day you're bombarded by these images of people drinking and they're happy and laughing and the James Bond image and all the rest of it. And it does hit you. This is a lot to do with your self image um, and I think I talk about this in the second book, but self-image is a very powerful thing. It's not just how we look, you know, we don't just look in the mirror and think, yeah, I look all right today. Self-image is how you act. It's, you know, your politics, your race, your religion, your country, all of this builds into who you are. Um, and when we're drinking, we, we hang on to drinking icons because we see our drinking in a certain way. Like James Bond is a classic one. Um, and it can be really hard to let go of these images. I mean, I did it myself just a couple of weeks ago. I'd just done a Friday night live and I was uploading it to um, YouTube. Um, and, you know, like really creepy, these things, they kind of almost read your mind and start showing you things of stuff. I obviously did a search on it on Google or something, but there was a documentary about Oliver Reed. Um, and I really foolishly started watching it, but it kind of brought back because I, I, I grew up in Rains Park where Oliver Reed lived. Um, and so he was like a very well-known figure around there. Um, and that kind of really took me back as well. So it can hit you at strange times. But the thing you need to bear in mind is, again, like everything else, it's just false. Um, it's a complete nonsense. And that's another of the things that you do need to do. It's not just about not drinking again, but changing your self-image is quite important because when we drink, because we're drinking a lot, we build in a lot of being a drinker into our self-image. So it can be that weird thing when you sort of stop, but you still kind of think drinking is great and cool and brilliant and reflects well on people because that's what you've been telling yourself for years and years and years when you've been drinking. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look and see if there's any questions here. Um, 
so yeah coping mechanisms coping tools and mechanisms are a huge part of my sobriety excellent yep certainly should be um do, do, do. i don't know that there's any particular questions uh no i think that's pretty much it Oh, here we go. I'm 14 days alcohol free. Does everything really get better? I feel so lethargic all the time. Feels like I will always be this way. So go onto the website. There's an article on there. How long does it take to feel better when you quit drinking? It might not be that exact title. I can't remember. But basically, um, lethargy is part of quitting and it will use the worst case person I ever knew had it for about a month. So you're 14 days alcohol free. I would expect within the next couple of weeks at the absolute outside, you will wake up one day and suddenly feel a lot better because to go into the mechanics very slightly, um, alcohol is a sedative. Um, and when you drink it, your brain becomes hypersensitive so it can work under the sedating effects of the alcohol and then the alcohol wears off and your brain's racing ahead so you feel anxious and a bit out of sorts and you find sleeping difficult and all the rest of it okay when you're drinking regularly your brain is in that hypersensitive state almost constantly so when you're drinking daily it's always like that so when you do finally stop for the first time in however long you've been drinking for your brain goes back to normal so it's suddenly not in that hypersensitive mode. It's the equivalent of if you're drinking seven or eight cups of strong coffee every day and you suddenly cut it out. You feel really drained and tired until your brain gets back to normal. So yes, it is absolutely part of it. 14 days, you're probably right in the middle of it. I would guess that you were a regular daily or most day drinker. Um, and that's all it is. So that will disappear fairly soon. And a lot of people find it is as quick as they just suddenly wake up one day and they just feel different. They suddenly feel better than they have in years. And all it is, is your brain chemistry is back to normal. You've been going through so many years of having a sedative. So your brain's reacting to it and you're going through this horrible cycle backwards and forwards and you've got your brain chemistry back to normal and you've suddenly got a decent night's sleep. And that is how you feel all the time. Um, and that is what some people call the pink cloud. So you hear this a bit, they say, oh, the pink cloud. And this is like a euphoric time you go through when you quit drinking. And it kind of suggests that it's this kind of false high that you get. Um, and I just want to say it's not a false high. That's how people who don't drink and aren't addicted to drugs, that's how they experience life. Okay. It lasts for the whole rest of your life as long as you don't drink again but you will probably get used to it okay because when you experience something all the time it stops impacting your your conscious mind okay you will feel that good for the whole rest of your life but you probably won't appreciate it all the time because it becomes the norm it becomes your new norm okay but it's worth keeping that in mind because in five ten years whatever you're constantly being daily bombarded with images of people drinking and it's very easy to start glorifying and looking back on it but just remember how much alcohol is actually taken from you um so let's just see if there's any other questions finally worked out a way to look at questions when i'm on I think that's pretty much it. So I think we're done. Excellent. So I hope that was useful for everyone. Um, I will be back again next week, probably if it's of interest. So I will, um, I'll post again on Thursday. Um, and if, yeah, I mean, I won't do the lives if people aren't interested in them, but as long as there's interest, so I'll put a post on Friday. So any questions or topics or anything, do feel free to put them in. Um, and I will, yeah, hopefully see everyone next week. Have a good weekend, everyone. See you soon.